Hello, everyone, and welcome to Diversity and Inclusion and Preparing Women for the Future of the Workplace. My name is Erin Andre, and I'm the Chief Human Resource Officer at Informatica, and strongly believe that for beliefs to change, the experience must change. And I'm here today with an impressive group of panelists that have dedicated much of their career to changing the work experience. And I'd like to introduce the panelists. Um, today we have Adrian Smith, who's the Global Director of Inclusion and Diversity at WPP. Celeste Warren, Vice President, Global Diversity and Inclusion at Merck. I have Donald Fawn, the Senior Director Global Office of Culture, Diversity, and Inclusion at Walmart. And Wendy Davidson, President, Away From Home, Kellogg, North America. So we're gonna jump right in because if I talked about their backgrounds, I'd take up all the time. So their bios are out there at World of Women Future Forum for you to look up and I encourage you to do so. So the first question team how do you see diversity and inclusion as a differentiator in being an employer of choice during this global reset that we're in the middle of? And Adrian, I'm going to start with you. I knew you were going to start with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I would say it's all about the people and the talent. Um, because with this new, uh, this reset, if you will, it, it's provided us with a new lens on how we look at people and what we value. Um, it's given us an opportunity to rethink what our organization's purpose is about. And we want to create environments where there's uh, an alignment, where people are able to be their authentic and most creative selves, especially for me in the advertising industry where we all are about creativity and you know being able to create messages and tell stories and so with that you need an environment that fosters people to come and be their true and authentic selves to bring in their diverse backgrounds so that we can create a more collective and collaborative um, environment so my short answer is it's all about the people and it's all about the talent the talent great Donald, how, how about you? How yeah, um, it, are you looking it, at it, Walmart? Yeah, it is a hot topic today about the global setting, but every time some people talk about it, and it's centered around the, uh, the economy side of it, and also talking about the reopening and the, uh, and the, uh, the new normals. But it's kind of a less on a social side of it, social uh, justice and uh, the racial justice, the moral story side of it. And uh, so, you know, the corporate uh, NGOs and the policymakers must do everything they can to, uh, to promote a inclusive recovery and to build a world that is, uh, you know, benefit all segments of the society. You know, our DNI efforts uh, is really pivoting on, you know, promoting the or uh, fostering an inclusive uh, and equitable environment in the culture and to help remove the injustice, uh, inequity in the workplace as well as in the social systems. You know, after the, the tragedy of uh, George Floyd, the, the Walmart committed uh, $100 million to create a racial center, hmm. uh, really focusing on four institutional areas. Uh, they're focusing on the change of those, uh, uh, the four institutional areas, uh, like uh, finance, uh, health, uh, education, and uh, 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 the criminal uh, justice system. <clears throat> and uh, another example is so Walmart sponsored the, uh, <clears throat> a research with FSG on the topics of uh, advancing frontline women, realizing the full potential of a retail workforce. When we look around the 50 plus uh, the corporate practices, put uh, the put put into place uh, by 11,000 the retail stores for over 30 plus years, and we find out 
that uh, the 12 uh, evidence-based practices on women's advancement are really fall into three critical areas, leadership commitment and uh, accountability and uh, the, the corporate uh, policies and uh, practices, as well as the career and the development opportunities for women. And we leverage uh, those uh, research findings to inform our DNI uh, efforts or practices uh, in the field operations. Now, in other words, hmm. diversity and inclusion definitely uh, can become a, a competitive uh, advantage, right? If we helping addressing the top three challenges uh, that keep the CEOs awake at night like talent, business growth, inclusion. And we, if we do it right, definitely we will be perceived as employer of a choice and the business of a choice uh, based upon the, uh, the relations, uh, trust relationship. Well, that sounds very comprehensive. And um, it'd be great to read some of that research that's coming out of the studies that um, Walmart is doing. Um, Thank you. Let me... You're welcome. Let me evolve that a little bit more and um, maybe Wendy, talk about what your organization is doing to innovate and create a stronger equal opportunity workplace um, for women. Specific. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. At Kellogg's, obviously, sorry, now I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> At Kellogg's, it's really important for us to have a workplace that mimics the broader marketplace. We've got to be able to, um, as Adrian said, be able to market and speak to the consumer, but we also need to make sure that we're attracting talent that will help us to be competitive in that regard. And so we look at it really in three ways. One is, um, as Donald said, leadership commitment. <clears throat> and that's a commitment not just to representation, um, in which case our, our goal is 50% representation of all managerial roles uh, by 2025. And we're making progress against that. But part of that also requires transparency um, and visibility, both internally and externally. It's one thing to have those goals. It's another to actually put those on paper and then tell people where you're falling short of those and what you're doing to make that different. Part of that is our commitment in the marketplace. Um, so externally, who are we partnering with? Um, our supplier diversity programs, investing in women entrepreneurial organizations through our 1894 venture capital arm. Are we investing in small women-owned startups um, that can be a part of our incubator programs? We've signed on to the Catalyst CEO Champions for Change initiative so that we're putting leadership commitment in the external marketplace for visibility of what our goals are as we go forward. And then partnering with organizations that can both help teach us um, help us support our team members, our women team members with additional development opportunities. It's one thing for stretch assignments. It's another for advocacy and sponsorship and mentorship inside the company, but it's another to ensure that we're investing in the communities and in our industry and giving that forum for our team members to engage with customers and colleagues and build um, a broader commitment, really using the Kellogg voice to drive mm -hmm. a positive change in our industry. Mm -hmm. It's really impressive as all of you so far have talked about both balancing the internal, the consumer, as well as the employee experience. Oh. <laughs> now, Wendy, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, and, I'm, and I'm also taking notes. I'm getting some great ideas to um, bring back to my workplace. Um, Celeste, how about you? The um, DNI, we've talked about talent, the challenge play in how we reimagine the workplace. Um, how is your organization, um, Merck, looking at attracting talent in this new age for women? So this, this is, um, I think this year with all of the challenges that we've had with the pandemic and the protests around civil injustice um, has served as, uh, I think, arguably, not arguably, unmistakably a call to action. Mm -hmm. um, and 
leaders, if they're being smart or paying attention to what's happened the first half of this year, and they're taking that into account to understanding their talent and how they need to reshape how they're looking at their organizations and being able to, to acquire, retain, develop, and, uh, and attract talent. So we've learned um, a lot of different things. This year has taught us a lot of different things. One, um, the capabilities of leaders. Those skill sets that leaders that made them successful in the past may not necessarily be the ones that we want them or need them to have in the future. Um, they have to be more inclusive. They, those, those skills that we were scrutinized as women, you know, those soft skills that we seem to always have and be, and be criticized about, those are the skills that you need in this type of an environment. You need to be a more inclusive leader. You need to be able to make sure that you're connecting and taking the time to connect with your employees in a much more distinct way than we have in the past. So making sure that we have that environment, that inclusive environment around the organization is gonna be really important. Um, the impact of 2020 has taken its toll on the health and well-being of our employees, both physically and mentally. And so we're gonna to need to make sure that we're addressing that in the future. So really been paying attention to our health and well-being programs, our offerings, our policies, our procedures, and very importantly, the manager practices. Um, to make sure that they have an environment where people can balance that intersection of their work and their home lives. Mm -hmm. um, also, the impact of the, the pandemic and working virtually has really caused leaders to examine where employees work and how they can be productive and what that workforce can look like and achieve. And so um, bricks and mortar may not be needed as much as a strong IT infrastructure, for example. So if, when you look at the talent, that has impact for women, it has impact for persons with disabilities, it has impact for a whole uh, um, spectrum of, of potential employees and candidates and those in the labor force around all the dimensions of diversity. Um, those individuals that uh, in face-to-face -face meetings that they didn't feel as comfortable or as confident and bringing up issues. They'll chat away on the, you know, type away on the chat and bring up their ideas. And you hear all of this, mm -hmm. all of these wonderful different ideas and, and innovative ideas and creative ideas that the leaders are saying and managers are saying, wow, you know, I didn't really hear from her before. And now I'm really just starting to get some really good ideas. So being able to um, understand more about people's different dynamic working styles and understanding that versatility is really, really going to be important moving forward. And so taking all of those different things into, into place is going to be important. And the last thing is, um, as our employees working from home, with, their 20, with the 24-hour news cycles at their, their, their disposal and their knowledge about current events impacting their lives and their livelihood, that's enhanced and awakened, what I call hasten that um, employee awakening. And it contributes to their wanting to be um, demanding uh, to be a more empowered workforce. So as we think about how are we creating that environment that, em that employees can feel engaged and enabled and empowered to be productive and successful, all of those things we have to take into account as we are recruiting in this labor market, which is very, very different um, than in the past, and also creating an environment that is very, has to be um, inclusive of all these nuances moving forward. Yeah, it definitely is a, a new world and it's interesting. There's no geographic boundaries really. If you're working from home, your employment pool is, is much broader. Um, when you talked about um, Celeste, the uh, more inclusive leadership skills that are required, it reminds me of a quote, we don't necessarily need more women in the workplace. We need more win that men that behave like women. Um, no, no offense, Donald. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think now when people are at home and we're really experiencing their personal life at the same time we're presented, you know, with them in a work environment, it really does create opportunities to innovate. And, and maybe with that, Adrian, maybe you could talk a little bit about what your organization is doing to innovate, to create this stronger workplace. Um, 
yeah. for the world we're operating in now or for developing women? So, you know, I think this is definitely an interesting time for, you know, all of our organizations because, you know, we have been forced to enact what I call that forward focused thinking now. So, you know, the mm -hmm. future is always so uncertain. So I even stopped using the term because the reality is we have to act now, but we need to be forward focused in our thinking. And we still set the same goals and aspirations, but we do the work now. The opportunity I think that WPP at this point has is that we're almost starting as like um, a new company, a startup, you know, under previous leadership. Yes. Under previous leadership, we were, you know, operating like a, a, a hedge fund. So all of our agencies were essentially competing against one another. But now, you know, under the leadership of Mark Reed and Jackie Canney and Judy Jackson, we are working on a more of a collective co um, coordinated effort where all of our agencies or we're encouraging everyone to work together. So now we're setting a foundation where we level set differently. And we're really looking introspectively of what we can do different now that will foster better relationships and a better work environment for women, black people, people of color, everyone, you know, with what, whatever um, underrepresented community that we have within our organization. Right now, as we are rebuilding and restructuring what that organization looks like, embedding inclusion and diversity into our every sector and silo of our organization is what's critical for us. So one of the parts, you know, that we're looking at is shifting the culture and sort of ridding, I guess I would like to say legacy, legacy leadership or legacy culture that has created barriers for us to have that forward focus movement. And so how do we do that? We have to look at our internal numbers as it relates to inclusion and diversity, um, what we're doing in terms of that improvement, but we know that we can't do anything externally until we have made sure that our numbers and we're moving in terms of mm. correcting those numbers now. So we've definitely implemented programs to support women, whether it's training and education. And you know, I'm a big um, L&D supporter, and I know that when you provide people with education, and you provide them with knowledge that essentially connects them to you stronger and deeper. So whether it's um, what we call our, our sessions or safe room sessions that allow women to talk about some of their issues and how they could be better supported and then providing sponsors and supporters of those women in the organization, programs like that have definitely become a part of the natural fabric and fiber, you know, mm -hmm. looking at pay equity gaps and how we can improve those numbers. Some of the same things that have been traditionally done, but now with a, a different lens. We have over 350 agencies, you know, within our network wow. and they have, you know, various starting points, if you will. So we have definitely resources that some agencies that don't have that footprint and, and legacy of IND now we can provide them with that support and, and, and learn lessons from our sort of agencies that have been in the journey longer. Um, so yeah, and mu you must need great flexibility. I mean, everyone at a different point, um, the same solution won't fit. It doesn't. And you know, the goals? To, that, to that point, you know, I always use the term since we, you know, inclusion and diversity, it means something different all over the world. So, you know, what it means in the US doesn't mean the same in the UK or China or Brazil, it's, it's different everywhere. So mm -hmm. our strategy is to create what I call global consistency, but provide local relevance or allow our agencies the license to add local relevance to their individual markets. So this again, mm -hmm. you know, we can set the goal and tone for what we want our WPP brand and culture to be, um, but essentially we want to all of our brands to have that authentic, that authenticity so that they can work properly and connect with all of our brands globally. Hmm. Great, because I, you know, I think back, I think it was you, Wendy, that said you had the goal of 50% of women in management roles at all levels. Um, and Adrian, when you're meeting people in different parts of the world, that won't work. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's it's aspirational, but your your journey is 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 definitely probably very different. Yeah, and the advantage that we have is that we are an advertising marketing company, and I challenge some of our leaders. I'm like, you can change the minds of everyone. You're an advertising executive. Mm -hmm. so 
you know, em empower the women in your organizations or in your country to let them know that young girls can inspire, aspire to be into in this industry or aspire to work um, when traditional yeah. women have been in positions where they are providers and, you know, at, well, they are workers at home or they are the ones who take care of home versus the ones who are out in the workforce. Um, yeah. So again, that educational piece and providing support and opportunity, yeah. learning opportunities within our organization, for me has been one of the most impactful things that I think we've been providing. Wow, very rewarding. So to, to change uh, the mind, you need to change the experience. Exactly. So, so Donald, um, you talked about the big initiatives and the dedication of Walmart and um, at so many levels, specifically around talent. Um, how are you refocusing your play for talent um, as you reimagine the workplace of the future? Yeah, I think uh, if you're looking at the, the, the recent the research, according to the, uh, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, the uh, average tenure in a single job uh, today comes down to 4.2 years, and the number is going down uh, the continuously, right? And the study also indicates uh, that or predicts that the 35% of the skills a worker needs uh, will have uh, changed by the end of this year, regardless of uh, industry. Now, it uh, really raised the, uh, the talent challenge in two areas. So one is a talent shortage, and at the other end will be the skill scarcity, right? And from the employee side of it, and uh, it will be, you know, they cannot, they cannot, uh, uh, just amassed a one skill, be a specialist uh, and expected to skate by for the rest of their careers. And uh, in order to succe succeed in today's business world, and they need to become a lifelong learner. And it also the uh, 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 know how to learn, unlearn, relearn and apply the new skills uh, pretty quickly. And from the, the company or corporate side of it, it will be, you know, it, it must be part of a overall strategy, uh, the talent strategies, like uh, 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 revisiting, redesign uh, jobs and uh, uh, attracting top talent, and it also the uh, investing in the uh, reskilling and the upskilling your workforce. And one example to address the future, though, is a talent. Uh, a challenge Walmart offers the associates uh, uh, affordability and it also accessibility to higher education through the one dollar a day college programs. And uh, today we have over like 110, 110 programs available for associates to, to select to get their bachelor degrees and the post uh, uh, post uh, higher education uh, degrees. Mm. And so its inception 2018, we have about 15,000 uh, associates uh, enrolled. And uh, among those, 58% uh, uh, are women and 42% uh, are people of uh, color. Now to build a future workforce and uh, really attract, develop and retain talent, and, uh, we must uh, curate and engage this innovative and diverse workforce. Hmm. Thank you. You know, you've talked about what Celeste talked about earlier. You're addressing the acquiring and then the retaining and the development um, as you attract talent. Celeste, um, when we look out 10 years, what, what do you think the future workplace looks like for women? What, what do you imagine? Well, first of all, when we have 90% of the CEOs as women. <laughs> wow. So we've gone from 50% of the managerial to 90%. Now that's an ambitious goal. So how are we going to get <laughs> Very yes. ambitious. But I think the workforce really, we hold the future, I think, of the workforce. And, and, I, and I mean that, I, I don't mean that facetiously, but it just basically, um, as I said, you know, those skills and those, those, um, competencies, those capabilities that women uh, have, and I'm speaking generally, naturally, 
um, the, the inclusive leaders, the leading with empathy, those skill sets are going to play, play um, have, a, have a strong prevalence in the future organizations. We look 10 years out. Another thing, too, is you think about as mothers, I'm a mother, and, and um, I think about um, we've been the CEOs, the COOs, the primary care physicians, the um, uh, who else? The CFOs. We know yeah. we've been all of these different things in our in our households, and those skill sets are things I tell women this all the time. It's like you know that are that are wanting to re-enter the workforce after taking time off to be, to, to raise their children. I say those skill sets you bring into the workforce, they're needed in the workforce. Being able to, to multitask and do a whole lot of different things and focus when you have you know, kids that are screaming and hollering in the background, being able to still focus on what you're doing. All of those skill sets are very, very much needed. So I see, when I look out 10 years and I look at what the, what, where, the, it, where the world is going, where the globe is going, where the businesses are going, they're much more dynamic, they're much more fluid. And as I said, not so much bricks and mortar, but more looking at the IT infrastructure and making sure that they can reach everyone across the globe. Those skill sets that are gonna be needed in that space to operate in that dynamic workforce, we're gonna all, the women have those skill sets in abundance. And so being able to make sure that we take those skill sets and stay relevant, um, mm -hmm. And when I mean relevant, meaning not so much understanding the skill sets that organizations need today, but what do they need tomorrow? What do they need in the future? And being able to have those capabilities and those skills to add and augment to those, those other skills, those leadership capabilities that we have. I think we're gonna, we, we are going to reach, reach a point where we are just knocking down that glass ceiling. We're knocking down doors and knocking down obstacles and barriers to be able to just really lead in the future. So from all of you, I've heard some great goals, super initiatives. Let's, let's look out 10 years. Maybe, you know, each of you, Celeste, do you see us achieving gender equality within the next 10 years? Is that a realistic goal? Are, are we that close? Is it, is it sooner? What do you think? So I, I, I absolutely think that we will. And the reason why I do that is, and, and, and I'm going to speak for our organization. This has been a journey that we've been on since, in a, for a long time. And the reason why I say it is capable to happen in 10 years, because we've seen it. We started doing pay equity analysis um, across gender and also in the United States across the race and ethnicity back in 2011. And we have been able to, to just really chip away, chip away, chip away at, at those, uh, those inequalities and at the different, the gaps that we saw from the standpoint of pay. And so we definitely believe that it's achievable. And then when we think about beyond pay, but think about representation at the leadership levels, when we think about equality from the standpoint of uh, the environment in which we all work, if we, if we work on the, equity, the representation of women and we have more women in leadership roles, we will each reach one and teach one from that perspective. And I think Ooh, that I we'll like get that. there. And if we're doing the equity analysis, if, if organizations are doing the equity analysis and not just analyzing, but putting the resources, the funding to close those gaps, then we will achieve it. And, and we have to also put um, things in place where, just like when you're cutting your grass, you think that you can cut it once and it's not going to grow back. It will grow back if you don't keep cutting it. So you have to put the underlying policies and practices in place for managers from the standpoint of making decisions around the, the pay of who they're hiring, what positions they're putting women in, not just the staff functions, but also in line P&L roles, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to do all of those practices to, to make sure that we don't, we don't, you know, go back to how things were because mm -hmm. it's easy to do that. You have to work to drive change. Mm -hmm. And if we don't work to do that continuously, we will find ourselves falling back to where we were. Mm -hmm. I like that analogy of mowing the lawn. You really got to keep focused on it. Otherwise it grows back. Yep. So Wendy, with, with the ambitious goals of 50%, do you think 10 years is realistic 
till you get there or? I think it's absolutely there? realistic. Um, and, and, and we're pretty close to that. So I would tell you that of our um, board, almost half of our board are women, almost half of our executive committee are women, um, and almost half of our management are women. Um, but exactly what Celeste said, it's not something that you can sit back and rest on uh, because you're gonna continue to have turnover. So it's both the leading indicators as well as it's the outcomes. And I think you said it, Aaron. Um, and I can't remember where this came from, but it's a results pyramid. They talk about results are simply the outcomes of our actions. We take actions based on our beliefs and our beliefs are shaped by our experiences. We have to as leaders, but also as companies, and you look at the people on this call, big companies with a global footprint, the potential for us to establish an experience that shapes beliefs about what it looks like for doable um, balanced leadership teams and that need for a pipeline of available and ready talent is absolutely doable, but we can't relax and, and expect that to stay the same. Within our company, we've looked at how do we hold people accountable, not just for the numbers that we have at each level, but everything from when a position is open, the slate of candidates we're looking at, mm -hmm. the people who are on the interview panel to ensure that they are diverse as okay. well. Because unconscious bias will play a role in the people that we tee up. So even if we say we want the very best candidate, if you don't have diversity in the pipeline and you don't have diversity at the table making those selections, you will end up with um, sameness in your leadership team and sameness in the roles that we're hiring for. But we also have to provide opportunities for stretch. We tend to mm -hmm. take, um, and I think we know this from research, women will look at a role and if they have 90% of the qualifications, they'll say, well, I'm close. Um, men might have 50% of the qualifications and say, I got this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we have to challenge as leaders women to step into challenge assignments and then we need to provide the support around them to ensure that they get the experience and the support to be successful in those roles and not become an example of see that's why xyz you can't put those people in those roles so we've got to be intentional in everything we do to ensure that we've got balanced representation yeah and and that's you know a great reminder for all the women that um, are listening to this forum today um, to, to really lean in on that. So back on the question on timing, Adrian, you talked about global differences. Um, is the timing different than globally? When, when do you see us reaching gender equality and leadership globally? You know, I, I think it's a, a process and, you know, someone starts with a journey and as it relates to the space of advertising and marketing and inclusion and diversity just if we start with the u.s and how we've moved we, we and we've been flowing through like 10-year cycles i believe of we started with diversity then the focus was on inclusion then it became equity and now it's about accountability and i think our other organizations globally are watching what we do in the u.s and the uk and we're we're providing resource guidance and direction for everyone else to follow um, so I, I think the, the learning curve, hopefully based off of what we've experienced here in the U.S. and the footprint that we're providing will sort of shorten that gap for the other countries that are looking to us for leadership. Um, you know, my, my, my motto is that we can't talk about it anymore. We have to be about it. So don't talk about it, be about it. And we've seen the research, you know, whether it was from you know, um, McKinsey that did a report in 2014 or the report that was done in 2018, we know that inclusion and diversity and putting women in positions of power affects the bottom line. So if they're looking at it from a dollars and cents point of view, then what is your growth opportunity? Look at your staff and make sure that you're putting women and people of color in positions so that your business can grow. And, you know, as everyone else said, you know, we women have served in these positions and we have the transferable skills to be successful. So, you know, with these transferable skills, with the confidence, with the support that we have from our organizations and that we provide, you know, this thread of information for all of our groups, um, then I think we, we can shorten that gap. And now is the time. I think everyone is at that point of, we have to be accountable so we don't return 
to those bad habits and we're creating sustainable change. And I think that's been the issue of, you know, we think about cutting the grass, you know, sustainability is about continuing to mow the grass so it stays fresh and, you know, smells good. <laughs> smells good. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're putting in systems um, that make sure that these changes that we're implementing and uh, to create a global, more diverse and, and equitable position for women to thrive, building systems um, that create sustainable opportunities are what we have to do. Yeah, and, and there's definitely you know a, an energy that's come with this global reset of the pandemic, George Floyd. Everyone it just seems is feeling different and. I like, don't talk about it, be about it. And that's what it feels like the last six months have been, you know, to. We're in a state of action. We're in a state yeah. of, um, you know, I use this quote by Silvia Wagoda, who was a um, Jewish woman who started the uh, Holocaust Museum in Atlanta. And she talked about the bystander, um, you know, she gave a quote on bystanding. She says, there are three people in every atrocity the perpetrator, the victim, and the bystander. And the worst of these is the bystander because they further empower the perpetrator as they, um, and they further, they further victimize the victim by empowering the bystander. And I think hmm. with the George Floyd situation, we were able to see three bystanders watch the cop take the life out of George Floyd. But then we became bystanders of those bystanders, right? And so right. Now the world is thinking differently about how we respond to issues of injustice, how we respond to issues of inclusion and diversity. And I think the general sentiment is we want to do better and we want to be better. And we have to be accountable for our actions and just make the change now. Again, we know what the numbers are. We've seen the percentages. We know that it's a winning point. So now it's about each of us leaning in and stepping in and doing the actual work. And, you know, with the organization that I'm with, the WPP, I think that's what we're about doing right now is changing yeah. the mindsets, believing in the purpose that we've established and just getting people to actually do the work. And if, if it comes to a point that we have to reevaluate the legacy of culture and the legacy of leadership, then that's what has to happen again for that sustainable change to make a difference. Great, and some wonderful notes that I took down to, to remember as well. That was a great quote. I actually got chills. Um, Donald, so uh, I was originally asking, do we think this change is going to happen in 10 years? Now I want to change it. Do you think we'll get there in three to five? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm pretty optimistic. And, uh, you know, uh, but uh, it, on the, in the meantime, uh, I admit, and uh, we still have a long way to go. If you're thinking about the women's rights movement, right, started or initiated uh, from the uh, 60s and seven, 1960s and the 70s. And, uh, you know, after those uh, 50 years, uh, even we, uh, though we witness uh, a lot of uh, our continuous uh, progress uh, made, but we still have a long, long way to go to long way to go. Yeah, to, to go that gap. And, uh, you know, we, our company, uh, the Walmart is committed to achieving the uh, uh, gender parity and uh, racial parities by 2030. And uh, we're serious about that, as uh, uh, the Wendy mentioned it earlier, right? And uh, with Catalyst, uh, with uh, uh, the Paradigm for Parities, and uh, we, we make sure we get there. We strategize it, the plan for it, with a very explicit uh, near-term, mid-term, and the long-term, uh, we call it aspirations. And we, we specifically map it out to uh, nine uh, frontline positions uh, that historically low uh, presentation for women and people of colors. And uh, just to make sure each, uh, each month uh, we report it to our CEOs with the, uh, the gap status so for each of his direct report. And mm -hmm. uh, our CEOs uh, leverage that kind of a report and to carry on the, uh, the conversations with the senior executives on a regular basis. And uh, you know, each year, we required our 77,000 managers to mentor or sponsor at least the two associates who are not uh, your uh, direct reports, 
and uh, who have a different background. And mm. you know, over, over a year, two, about the 200,000 associates going through this uh, program. So the, this uh, mentoring culture really help us uh, to strengthen the, uh, uh, the talent uh, pipeline and uh, talent bench uh, among the mentor, uh, mentees and the 63% of the program participate are women. And uh, mm. it is uh, uh, pretty significant. And uh, additionally, we uh, adopted the Leaning Circle to engage more women and uh, either along the journey, either uh, through the mentoring circle or through their peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning uh, groups. Additionally, we also introduced the Catalyst uh, Advocate Real Change uh, uh, workshop oh. to educate our male leaders to become an ally and champion to help advance the gender parities uh, in our workplace. Wow, very, very comprehensive. It almost it reminds me a little bit, Celeste, of reach one, teach one, mm -hmm. um, you know, going at all levels. So you've all given us great examples of what corporations can do, how we can hold corporations accountable, be innovative, strive towards the numbers. I want to change the question a little, and we have, I'll call them maybe bystanders um, that are in the audience today. How, what advice would you have, uh, mentorship advice, um, Donald, you just talked about mentoring, for the young women that are aspiring to pursue a leadership position so they don't become bystanders and they lean in and have a successful career. So what one piece of advice would each of you give to the women in the audience here today? Wendy, let's start with you. Well, I would say use your seat at the table. Um, years ago, I was on a panel and they asked, what's that one moment when you knew that you were different? It was a women's panel. And everybody had this example of some time where they'd been sort of left behind. And I didn't have that, um, mostly because my father had um, me at the table, at the dinner table with candidates, executive candidates. He was interviewing for positions at the company. What I hmm. learned later in life was that he was teaching me that my age and my gender and my experience didn't limit my ability to have a voice um, hmm. on a particular topic. And I've encouraged people since then, you have a seat at the table. The table might be the kitchen table, it might be the boardroom table, it might be just a conference room table, use that seat to use your voice and drive positive change for both the people not in the room at that table, but also to impact additional seats that should be around that table for people who aren't represented so that you don't become the only one, um, but you are mm -hmm. one driving change for many. Hmm. Great, thank you. How about you, Adrian? Oh, you're on mute. I'm, there I mean you go. <laughs> That's one I tip. Said, in that second, I said some great things. Um, <laughs> but um, I have two things. Uh, one is, you know, sort of in line with what Wendy says, and that is know that you belong, you know, to the young women in the audience. You do belong. And so feel that, own that, and claim that. And the other thing is, and especially as we think about during this time of period of quote unquote isolation and quarantining is to make sure that you build your own individual brand. And I say that because, you know, it's, it's a, a talk that I heard that struck me to my core when a woman talked about an organization that she worked for and she said they would always know her for, you know, Cindy at, you know, XYZ company. Cindy and XYZ, she can get us this. Cindy at XYZ can get us that. Make sure you invite Cindy at XYZ and you know, she'll get us on and everything that we need. But as soon as Cindy left XYZ, her phone call stopped, the invitations disappeared. Mm. She just became Cindy and it was nothing. So mm. my, my advice is to make sure that you're known for who you are, the quality of work that you do, um, how you treat people, your 
purpose and point of life so that when people are thinking about you and thinking about positions they would like you to be in, it's not because of an organization that you were attached to, but it's because of the quality of work that you've done and because of the type of person that you are. And, you know, I always like to say, um, that's how I've tried to live my life. You know, people are always like, we don't know what Adrian does, but you know, you might want to ask her. Um, so if you just think about that and being able to build your own individual brand so that even in spaces of isolation and quarantine, that you can still be brought up as a person, a go-to person and people connect, can connect with you. Great advice. Thank you. Donald, what's your advice for the young women in the audience? Okay. I, I would say uh, become uh, self-aware at an early age. That means uh, spend a serious time so, to contemplate uh, who you are and uh, the where you can, can, uh, come from and uh, what your value is and uh, who you want to be and, and mm. then how I can get there, right? And this is uh, the self-awareness uh, effort, exercise uh, definitely will benefit you in your uh, lifetime. And uh, it doesn't matter whether it's your personal or professional. And uh, it's a part of uh, the, uh, the leading yourself with purpose. And uh, if you don't know yourself well, how can you lead yourself? If you can lead yourself, how can you lead others, right? I think this is a pretty critical. I remember uh, at one time, uh, the retired general, uh, her name is uh, Becky, Becky uh, Hostad, and uh, she's speaking, we invite her to speaking at one of our women leadership uh, event. She said the leadership is a choice. And uh, the first uh, person <laughs> you must lead is yourself. And another, another uh, piece of advice, especially for today's uh, younger generation, I would say, uh, spend time uh, to learn new skills uh, through the extracurriculars uh, beyond the classroom uh, education. And I'll give you an example. <clears throat> and the WOMA is a primary sponsor of uh, Go Who Codes, a national uh, initiative uh, really expand the opportunities for girls uh, in technology. And uh, I, I, uh, the STEM development on youth is uh, so uh, critical and vital when we look into uh, the futures. And this program is uh, on track to uh, close the, gap, the gender gap at the uh, entry level jobs uh, by 2017. It's, it's a great uh, programs. If you have, uh, <clears throat> If you have that the program available in your area, try to enroll it. It's a free of charge, and uh, it's a, it's a, they have a, uh, a component called the clubs programs. Uh, uh, offer third grade goals through twelfth twelfth uh, grade goals to ex, uh, to explore the uh, coding. Coding, in, wow! Yeah, in a fun and. Uh, entertainment uh, environment it's yeah it's, lots of options lots of options out there so i think donald your advice is take advantage of them exactly yeah how about you celeste what would be um your advice well i think um uh, Wendy and Adrian and Don have taken a lot of mine so <laughs> i'll just say reiterate to elevate your voice for those that are in the room for yourself and those very importantly that aren't in the room, speak your mind. And then I think uh, nurture your mind, um, staying relevant, staying, um, making sure that you're you know, continuing, as I said earlier, to, to make sure that you're building the capabilities that you need, not just for now, but for the future. And then the last thing I think is to, while you're nurturing your mind, nurture your network. Um, it's important mm, that you yeah. have a close network of colleagues who can support you when you need it and those who can call you on it and support you when you think you don't need it. <laughs> so <laughs> I think those are the main things. Yeah, really seeking that advice that you need that only your network will tell you mm -hmm. if you ask. Yeah, great, great advice. 
Well, I, I think we've unfortunately run out of time, but I would personally love to keep chatting with all of you. And the good news is we actually can. So you all can continue this conversation both um, with the speakers and the fellow attendees um, by going online with uh, Women Future Forum. And you're also encouraged to share your favorite moments of this conversation on the digital media wall. I think there's a lot of great actionable advice, both for companies and for individuals to make a difference within those companies and the world. And what I hear is leverage the moment, um, lean in, and you don't have to have all those qualifications as Wendy referenced, you know, just go for it and know you belong. So thank you all for um, joining us today. It's been fun um, chatting with this group of panelists and um, welcome any further conversations. Before we sign off, anything last that someone was hoping to bring up that they didn't get a chance? Okay, then with that, thank, thank you. you all. It's been a pleasure. Nice way to spend part of my day. Virtually, <laughs> thank you. you know, on, you know at <laughs> home. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.